Good morning, class. This is the chapter uh, eight the, on metabolism. I know that we had covered part of it in the class, um, but um, for uh, conforming to the entire lecture point of view, I would be talking about the entire chapter, starting with the points that we already covered in the class also. Okay, so um, as usual, um, I always have normally the second slide with something um, or which which would have the important points of the chapter. But in this, I thought this was a good way to start this. Um, what I mean by there is no such thing as a free lunch is nothing, nothing at all is going to take place without a purpose. And there has to be some reason or some something which would move a particular material. It is not going to go on its own. That is the main reason. I mean, you could take it in many different ways. Uh, you like, like a g boy who wants to take a girl out for um, on a date has a purpose in mind. The girl who wants to go out with the boy on a date has a purpose in mind. And um, while that fits in as an analogy, in real life, what I'm trying to say is nothing would be done without something or without a reason or a backup. Okay. Um, the things that you should know about this chapter is what is catabolism, what is anabolism, what is metabolism per se. Okay. And the other material is listed. Now, I would like to go ahead and talk about um, just the cell, if you consider it. It is like a miniature factory. A lot of things are happening in a cell. Now, a um, lot of reactions towards breaking down material, a lot of reactions towards making or synthesizing different material. Okay, Metabolism is basically any pathway or any reaction or any series of reactions that are being uh, that are taking place it can be catabolic or anabolic now catabolic pathway would mean breakdown of complex molecules which might release energy okay so you will have like a large molecule which is broken down stepwise by a series of reactions to smaller molecules. And this process can release energy. This is catabolic pathway. Anabolic pathway, on the other hand, is lots of smaller molecules are put together and you end up having a large molecule. The forms of energy. To understand the forms of energy, I would, I normally in the class, I would put forward like a question to everyone and people come up with the different forms of energy that they know about. So the most common form of energy people mention is kinetic energy, potential energy, heat energy, and chemical energy, which is, which is bracketed um, in the food that we eat comes under the chemical energy and then you have light energy and so on. So to understand different energy conversions that exist, we'll go to the next picture. Okay, now consider a person who is on a diving board right here. At this point, this person has potential energy. Okay. When he is or she is in the process of diving, he's got kinetic energy because he's moving. When this person hits the water, okay, he's again got potential energy. Okay. And the next step wherein this person is coming back to the steps and climbing up the steps to reach the diving board again, this person is using the 
chemical energy that he or she has consumed and that energy is using up in the form of a kinetic energy it is sort of converted to kinetic energy in the system and climbing up converts the kinetic energy of the muscle movement into potential energy so back again to potential energy now this picture just tells you in different places the same person is having a certain form of energy and then another form of energy because of placement in another uh, part in this entire picture which that which tells you that you have certain energy which can be converted to different forms that's the conclusion that you can make from this picture okay then again i generally what i do in my class when i'm taking it as i normally take a ball i keep it on top of the table and then i ask my students about what and what kind of energy this ball has everyone comes up and usually they are correct they it has potential energy and in, when it's falling down it has kinetic energy when it sort of settles itself onto the ground it has got potential energy again and i always ask the potential energy it has here on top of the table the potential energy it has at the floor is it the same and most most of the time students are very clear in this particular understanding and they very very well come up with the right answer and say no the potential energy on top of the table is higher and the potential energy at the bottom on the floor is lower okay this is something it just of their own volition they know this out of all observations and practical observations that they have done and the studies that they have done in the past okay <clears throat> with this i would like to go over the first law of thermodynamics the first law of thermodynamics says energy can neither be created nor destroyed only transferred or transformed that's what is the first law of thermodynamics okay which means i say that you are in one position you have one form of energy another position you are on another form of energy it can neither be created nor destroyed you have potential energy when you are on the top you again have potential energy when you are at the bottom and it can neither be created nor destroyed then why do you have to keep eating why why more chem energy in your system why is there the requirement for this why do you have to keep eating to answer this i normally ask another question i have like a top which i bring to the class and this particular top i spin it okay when i spin this top it continues to keep spinning for another minute more than a minute and then it ends up it stops spinning okay it sort of stops now when it stops people know it will eventually stop first instance when it started spinning i gave it some mechanical energy and the mechanical energy that i gave enabled it to move and keep moving round round around and round where did i get that mechanical energy because of the chemical energy that i eat that comes from my food okay okay so what did i eat say bread so that means starch the source the starch where did it come from wheat the wheat plant where did it come from for the wheat plant so i'm just going back in step wise mechanical energy 
right came from chemical energy right and i gave it and that chemical energy came from the food that i ate and that food say it was bread and wheat plant now where did the wheat plant get that energy a lot of students ended up saying it got it from the soil it got it from the water it got it from no that's not what happened it was able to put together carbon dioxide and water okay it was able to put it together with sun's light energy so solar energy so ultimately all energy for people living in the earth is derived from solar energy okay so the flow of energy is uni unidirectional okay directional okay so now <clears throat> to understand why you cannot recycle energy what i wanted to tell you is you have this cheetah it chases the gazelle once it chases the gazelle outruns it kills it okay it is obtaining it is doing this to obtain chemical energy but remember the cheetah when it does it has really run so fast okay it has burned up a lot of chemical energy in its system once it has done that it has used that energy to run right and that particular energy that it has used up has made it out of breath literally out of breath okay and it sort of needs to how do i say um it breathes really fast and it needs to rest itself out kind of like it needs to cool itself off why cool itself because of all that running the body of the cheetah has really become hot so it would hang its tongue out sweat it out and cool itself okay now why did this happen you burned up chemical energy but why did your body get hot the reason for that is all that chemical energy was used up into kinetic energy by the muscles and it helped the muscles of the legs of the cheetah move run in which case a lot of that energy was being used up so this process where in one form of the energy is converted to another form there is some amount of energy lost as heat so every energy transfer leads to loss of some energy as heat okay this accounts for the second law of thermodynamics okay but there is another way to explain this which is explained in simple physics also we'll talk about that in the next okay <clears throat> whenever there is a temperature difference and that means in this temperature difference what happens is from the hot part of it into the cold part of it you would have movement okay so that means if you have a lot of people standing in an elevator in their system okay you have the cells going through a lot of reactions okay and they are all just standing in the elevator waiting for the elevator to move and about say 5 to 6 to 7 of them in an elevator standing suddenly the elevator feels very very warm the reason for that is whatever cellular reactions are taking place some of that is released out as heat so 
that is basically just reiterating the second law of thermodynamics okay another way to see this is if you are a person standing completely uninvolved with the earth and standing outside the earth and observing it you can observe that every energy transfer increases disorder so what they are trying to say is the whole world is moving towards disorder okay the whole universe is moving towards disorder there is another word to explain that it's called entropy okay so in scientific terms or in another way to represent this particular uh, second law is every energy transfer increases entropy or disorder of the universe okay an example i could give is rusting of car okay now this rusting of car or an unmaintained building if you just leave it as it is in one place you wouldn't be able to move it it will start rusting up now as rightly said a student in my class said when i said what will happen what do you think will happen to a car when you just leave it outside and not go near it for about say 5 6 7 months one you might have a parking ticket that's possible okay and supposing you have left it in a place where you're really not having to worry about parking tickets and such it is sort of exposed to the elements the natural elements that exist okay of sun rain coldness everything else that come along with it and slowly the car starts rusting the metal starts rusting did you do anything to it no you just left it as it is but this process took place on its own so this process sort of gives you an understanding that if you leave things and as it is it is going to move towards disorder that is the end point that you can understand from this particular example or take the example of an unmaintained building or an unmaintained garden okay it would just go move into disorder on its own okay now entropy is observed as increased heat and moving from less ordered forms of matter kind of like if i have an example to understand this i think i will go to the next uh, slide to show you a graphic representation bear with me okay <clears throat> first part the rusting of the car is like a spontaneous process you and me had no hand in it we did not work on it we did not do anything to it it happened on its own it can happen quickly it can happen slowly it really doesn't matter the point i would like to make is you and me did not put in any energy for this process to take place okay now an example of a slow spontaneous process is the rusting of the car of a quicker spontaneous process is breakdown of or like during cellular respiration you have breakdown of glucose into smaller particles like carbon dioxide and water okay so that is possible a non spontaneous process this process needs energy okay it has to be energetically favorable for any process to take place okay so i repeat the second law um again in other words is for a process to occur spontaneously it must increase the entropy of the world okay of the universe okay now i would like to take a few minutes to draw redraw what i was talking about in class and for students who haven't had the chance to attend the lecture it is like uh, helpful for them too so consider a hill and you have water on top of the hill okay water on top of hill the first thing you understand is it can flow down on its own it can flow on its own yeah okay 
and then it can go and settle itself at the bottom okay on its own without any any energy input from anybody spontaneously okay but this process imagine like the hoover dam for example example i would like to take is the hoover dam now hoover dam has this water on collected up and when it flows down or or say think niagara falls okay you have the water and it's flowing down can you imagine the force with which it flows down the flowing force that it has it's pretty high right now why waste it yeah let me put a turbine here a turbine is like a uh, something with blades and this turbine might move because of the water falling on it and it might move real fast now this moving real fast meaning this kinetic energy was converted to mechanical energy and that mechanical energy can be trapped to make electrical energy yeah and this is the basis of your hydel power projects okay now so water on top of the hill has got high potential energy right the potential energy is pretty high the water at the bottom of the hill has got low potential energy definitely lower than what was in the top okay and while it was flowing down it had kinetic energy it did that spontaneously without any energy input and it is a, the flowing force can be called used to make electrical energy which means this process releases energy yeah okay so that being understood i would like to sum it up in the next slide okay so water on top of the hill has high potential energy okay it can flow down on its own with no external input of energy it is spontaneous it releases energy it's also called exothermic in many reactions it is also called catabolic in many reactions i will come to this shortly please bear with me okay now i would like to give an example what could be an example now i had given example of water on top of the hill water at bottom of the hill what could it be an example real life example with respect to your biological system imagine glucose okay glucose is a high energy molecule now this high energy molecule can be broken down step wise to release carbon dioxide and water which are low energy molecules and this process is respiration okay on the other hand water which is at the bottom of the hill can you bring it up on its own no it cannot take place on its own it needs external input of energy a student in my class came up with the idea of the water cycle okay he said yes it can come on on its own without us having to take it up the water cycle at that time i said no this is not beyond this is not part of the scope of the what i am discussing okay but it led me to think how does that happen hey the sun's energy is evaporating it and it is breaking all the bonds 
moving it away from a structure which is in like a close by uh, with hydrogen bonds with it close by holding it as a liquid and moving it away up as the um what do you call gaseous form of water up in the sky and then it will fall down whenever it does sort of precipitates and gets together too much to bear and it falls down so again in that process sun's energy is a basic requirement for that particular water which is at the bottom of the hill to come up to the top of the hill eventually but that topic aside this was just to answer if there is a doubt coming up in that in that fashion another student said the water which is at the bottom of the hill can not be brought up on its own we have to carry it in buckets and go up okay now if we have to carry it in buckets and go up that means we are putting the external input of energy that means this process is non spontaneous it absorbs energy such reactions it's also called endothermic and it is anabolic reactions which are grouped under non spontaneous endothermic forms okay and the only way that they would come together is when the plants use sun's rays carbon dioxide and water and make it into sugar molecules these sugar molecules would be the glucose which has reached the top of the hill i hope this makes it very clear to understand what a anabolic reaction is okay what a catabolic reaction is which is spontaneous which is non spontaneous examples for both sides this particular page should be like a like a main wet wetting stone for you to keep coming back to this page in order for you to understand not only this chapter chapter 7 9 and 10 okay in order to understand all of these chapters you definitely need this page to keep coming back to it and understanding each and every term whenever you are going astray okay i have come up with a mnemonic to remember remember career catabolic reactions make atp with released energy from exergonic reactions if that helps you remember it that's also fine okay then we move on to another aspect of biology of order and disorder i had briefly mentioned something about order and disorder when i was talking about entropy of the universe right now living systems create there are two things that living systems do they create order from less ordered structures and for this energy is required they take ordered structures and create release less ordered structures and release energy from this the next page probably i can i can put together what i'm talking about when i'm saying they can create order from less ordered structures okay now i have carbon dioxide and i have water now these are smaller molecules low energy molecules small molecules okay low energy molecules and these can be put together to give me my glucose okay the glucose now suddenly there is some amount of structure and order to it okay it can look like this okay this is your simplest simply by form of glucose now this can go on to be more ordered more structured okay and energy input i need energy to make this i need energy to put these together to form a lots of glucose molecules together in which i have my my long chain starch 
okay so i can have something like this wherein at each of these steps joining these guys and making a more ordered long chain structure i need energy for this process so i life systems can create ordered order from less ordered structures into a more ordered structure okay they can do that but they need energy for this process on the other hand they can also okay like you can go back they can also take the ordered structures and release less ordered structures okay for this process you have say i have glucose in this case i'm taking the exact opposite example it can be systematically broken down to give me carbon dioxide and water so that means this is more ordered ordered or organized structure to give me less ordered structures but in this process i can release energy okay so this is just an a core of a of a plant stem which is showing you how much effort the plant has put in creating an ordered structure an ordered system in itself okay now i want to move on to talking about um a comparison with spontaneous and non spontaneous systems and what happens at each part but to explain this i would like to go to the next page and use a little bit of graphic material okay a person called gibbs a scientist from yale university came up with an explanation to sort of help us understand different systems when it becomes spontaneous and when it doesn't and so on he said every living system now every living system or not only living system everything has some amount of free energy present in it he called this free energy g okay now i normally do this when i am in class this is the table this is the ball present here the ball on top has potential energy everyone agreed the ball at the bottom will end up having potential energy eventually but lower potential energy and the ball on top will have higher now i normally ask my students to take and give me a number so this time i'll just go along with the number they gave me they gave me a number 48 it can have say a number potential energy 48 never mind what the units are and the potential energy here they said was 12 okay so i want to know whether what is the difference between the energy so g final minus g initial equals to a value known as delta g okay here in this case 12 minus 48 equals to minus 36 okay whenever delta g is negative i would like to represent it like this the reaction is spontaneous no energy no external energy required okay it can happen on its own so if delta g is less than 0 that's what another way of representing it this is the outcome so in order for you to understand whether a particular system is capable of doing work 
okay you need to find out what is the delta g and whether that particular work is going to require energy or whether it's going to happen on its own these two things are understood once you find out what the value of delta g is now going back to this previous picture okay here in this case if you have a high energy molecule on top okay and it gives me a low energy molecule this itself happens because it has got higher energy and the final ones have lower energy and the difference is going to be negative the delta g is going to be negative in which case it is an exergonic reaction the reaction will proceed in the forward direction without any input of energy on the other hand if i have carbon dioxide and water and plants are going to make glucose out of that i have to calculate the final delta g and it will end up being positive this is an endergonic reaction it requires energy in the form of sun's rays the energy input that it requires and with which it will use and the reaction will go towards forward and requiring the energy okay so <clears throat> once that's explained okay free energy is the energy available to perform work with certain conditions okay the more free energy that is available means it is unstable and it wants to reach the equilibrium less free energy means it is stable and it has reached equilibrium now i want to use this example in the next page that we'll go just before that this example comes next page but right now reactions in the living system will never reach equilibrium it can be there is should always be a difference it can be positive or negative but there should be a difference between the system and the surroundings that's what it means the cell and the surrounding there should always be a difference and if there is no difference that means the system will shut down and die okay the analogy that i tried to use in this is like a very a uh, practical analogy it is nothing it's got nothing to do with the cells that is present in this particular person's system or the cells that is present in this particular system it has got nothing to do kind of like if in this case this person is at equilibrium okay meaning the delta g he has reached it's probably like you know he's like sort of very much um in with the surroundings and he doesn't have any inclination to move from this status whereas this person definitely has to move to the house that can provide with some sort of hydration for him so that means he is going to still perform some amount of work or capacity in him is that he will move towards that he is aiming to reach equilibrium okay now the example of the hydroelectric system okay now here in this case in this chamber the water is at a higher level here there is a turbine and the water will flow and the turbine will move as long as the water is flowing the turbine will move and there is light that means the delta g is less than 0 it is negative value okay that means here it had higher energy it has lower energy and when you sort of take the difference the delta g is less than 0 and you would have the system now after some time both the energy energy here equal to energy here right and there is no movement of the turbine there is no light this system is dead okay on the other hand an open hydroelectric system which has a constant input of some material 
which means constantly this particular chamber will have a higher energy and this chamber will always constantly have a lower energy because it also loses some amount of material this will constantly make the turbine move and this will constantly keep this light on this system is live functioning okay on the other hand this is just to show that many many reactions that exist okay like you have like a to b to c to d to e okay if you have these reactions i'm sure the g that is present here is probably the highest in comparison to the g that is present here but it is in a stepwise gradual difference in g is making an entire pathway possible in this fashion kind of like all metabolic reactions that take place in our system okay so this is again a summation of what i had put forth in that um, diagram okay another way to read the whole process is if you see in this graph the free energy value for the reactants is pretty high and the free energy value of the reactants is pretty of the product that is is pretty low so that means the free energy or the g of the reactants okay and g of the products if you minus it because this is final this is initial you'll always have a negative value and you'll have energy released this is the progress of the reaction and this is spontaneous yeah amount of energy that is released and delta g is less than 0 that's what this tells you on the other hand this i mean this tells you it's an exergonic reaction spontaneous exergonic on the other hand the free energy of the reactants to start with is very low the free energy of the products is pretty high it is going to have a positive value and more than g that is more than zero that is okay this means it needs input of energy for this process it's an endergonic reaction it requires energy to take place okay so this is just another way to represent the whole uh, topic that i had explained so far okay then we move on to another aspect wherein it's called energy coupling kind of like quid pro quo you do something and i'll do something right okay now what are all the work that is done in a cell okay chemical reactions that take place then membrane transport meaning on the membrane you have some material which is on the outside it want it has to be transported inside so then there is a protein membrane protein which sort of accepts it with energy input okay and passes it on inside so this kind of membrane transport is also requiring energy then there is mechanical energy kind of like in a cell from one part to the other part if it has to transport certain things it goes along certain um microtubules or microfilaments and that process also requires energy okay or generally movement muscle movement will require energy Now how does this club club coupling work the clubbing of anabolic and catabolic pathways they are arranged to coordinate okay 
it's like this now if I have like say 10 pairs of jeans okay and I wear one every day and I put it to wash put it to wash put it to wash after 10 days do I have any pair of jeans no I don't how will I end up having those pair of jeans once I wash them through the washer and then they come out and then I can use it basically I regenerate it okay so going back what is the best form of energy that is understood by the cell and applicable to the cell kind of like the dollar currency is understood by people world over countries world over the ATP which is adenosine triphosphate I would like to go to the next page and explain this okay it is another simplified diagram I could put is I have a base a five carbon sugar okay and one phosphate group another phosphate group and another phosphate group these are the three phosphate groups that are attached to it this makes it adenosine triphosphate okay now basically the way it works is this phosphate groups have a large amount of negative charges but they are all bound together which sort of makes it a very highly unstable molecule and it prefers to break down give away the energy that it has and reach stability so what it can essentially do is the this particular last bond is the most unstable and releases maximum amount of energy so the ATP can combine with water and give me ADP and H2O sorry ADP and inorganic phosphate okay now this is like the 10 pairs of genes that you have you have used up used up used up used up they've all become this and then what happens where does the cell go to get more of this this has to be regenerated back and this is done this process can take place when ATP and H2O give the energy to all the anabolic reactions they need it and they break it down to this and then all catabolic reactions release energy and that energy is used to make put these two guys together to give me my ATP back okay so it's like a energy coupling between these two reactions okay the next page I'll repeat the whole process what I was talking about I have energy f coming from catabolic exergonic energy releasing processes all of that put this ADP and P inorganic phosphate together phosphorylated to give me my ATP and H2 and this ATP is used to make uh, for cellular work for energy consuming processes anabolic reactions okay to build stuff so for all of that I need that energy and I use this energy so once I have used it and it has become this if the energy coming from breakdown of a high energy molecule will help put this and regenerate it back okay this is energy coupling then we move on to the topic of enzymes okay enzymes basically are proteins a few enzymes exists RNA 99 percent I can have enzymes as proteins RNA molecules can act as enzymes they are called ribozymes okay now um, 
normally for any reaction to move from A to B okay that means it had certain bonds it had certain features I would like to go to the next page and explain this a little bit okay it had certain bonds it had certain features which sort of gets broken so from A so whatever that its structure was it has become B so for this process that means there is bond breaking okay then bond formation other some bond breaking and then some bond formation and in the first place they have to meet come in contact okay in your lab if you want to put together something one way that you could do this is heat say boil or near boiling it doesn't have to be boil all the time near boiling temperature and I can have A to B this is possible but in your body you cannot afford to cannot afford to heat up if you do that proteins get denatured kind of like your albumin of egg turning into your egg white in the pan so here the both are the proteins proteins are still present but the integrity structural integrity of the albumin is lost when he is all heated up it is completely a different structure he is no longer functional like the albumin he is totally different right so your body cannot afford to heat up in this fashion in order for you to get some amount of um, reaction to take place in addition to that if you boil up or bring up up to boiling temperature it can start it cannot be specific it cannot be specific okay so all reactions will take place will take place okay now if that is the case that's not helpful okay so in order for reactions to specifically take place without increasing temperature enzymes are used okay now you understood the purpose behind an enzyme it's kind of like a catalyst okay now um, to get to the understanding of activation energy um, I would like to one second I would like to erase and use this page again for my Now, oh, 
everyone understands the importance of enzymes the the purpose behind an enzyme okay now to talk about what is activation energy i use the example of bugs bunny okay just a second I use the example of Bugs Bunny and that bald guy. Herman. Okay, so now this bald guy in some of the cartoon, he's sort of like pushing up this. He's pushing a boulder up. He's pushing it. He's pushing it. He's pushing it. And it has reached here. Once it has reached, so he has to push it up here. Once it has reached here, the rolling down of the boulder happens on its own. Okay, so he has to sort of push it up a little bit to get it going, to get the action going. Okay, basically all molecules, okay, so that is what I was trying to tell. Okay, now all molecules move. Okay, and if you heat it, they move faster. And they are able to meet chances of meeting that is meet chances to meet is higher right but enzyme okay structure itself is in such a way that it sort of decreases the activation activation energy the structure is in such a way that it has a conducive environment environment for helping old bonds to break and new structure to form okay kind of when we go to the next picture okay so now without any enzyme because of this huge big wall the reactants do not become products very easily it takes a very very long time when the reactants are exposed to enzyme the activation energy barrier is lowered so you get products faster going to the next slide okay consider a reactant which looks like this okay and it takes it so much to reach a transition stage now this transition stage is like the boulder of herman reaching here right now it is at a transition state it is going to roll down okay and it is like in this stage very temporary kind of like you have a key ring and you're trying to put a key inside it and this key in this ring when you're trying to put wherever it is in the middle it is in the transitional stage and it is sort of most stable when it has reached the final stage right so this particular stage status that has happened during the course of the reaction is going to finally give me the products wherein it is favorable for the products to be there and the reaction moves from reactants to being products what an enzyme does is it decreases the amount of energy that activation energy required for that reaction to move or proceed further the course of the reaction with an enzyme sort of decreases when you have presence of enzyme the activation energy is decreased okay remember the delta g is not affected by the presence or absence of the enzyme delta g is as is that doesn't change that doesn't get affected okay now here is an enzyme 
Now this huge molecule almost looks like a dragon. Now this is a huge protein molecule. Okay. And this is the region which is called the active site. This is the site where the substrate or the reactant will go and bind itself to give me an enzyme substrate complex. Previously, they used to call it the lock and key fit. Kind of like the key is an exact fit to the lock. So the lock is the enzyme and the key is the substrate. But now they have come up with an induced fit. Kind of saying like your memory foam pillow. Wherein once the substrate sits, the enzyme fits over it and makes the structure an exact mold over the substrate like molds over the substrate okay that's called the induced fit theory okay so any reaction okay briefly conducted this is the way it would be this is your enzyme and it has two different substrates coming together they sort of are held together by weak interactions in the active site such as hydrogen bonds ionic bonds the active site lowers the activation energy and speeds up the reaction the substrates are converted into products once they are converted into products that space is not right for them and the fit is no longer right for them so they are released out okay once they are released out, this particular enzyme is free to take in more substrate. Okay. Okay. To go over this a little bit more, um, if I have, it's like I, I normally use uh, an example of the um, cash counters that are present, say, in Costco. Okay. Now, these cash counters are the enzymes. Okay. Now, people coming by, okay, standing in line, people coming by are the substrates. And the going out is the product. Okay. When they go out. So, if I have, say, 100 substrate molecules, and only four enzyme molecules, the speed at which I would get product is only so much. The rate at which I would get a conversion is only so much. How can I increase the rate of the reaction? I can increase the number of enzyme molecules. That can increase the rate of the reaction. So if I have substrate, okay, increasing rate would mean increase enzyme concentration but at a certain point what happens is there is a something known as saturation meaning all enzymes are are blocked with a substrate all enzymes so that means the rate of the reaction will only take place once the enzyme releases that particular into the product. Okay, so it has reached a saturation point at a certain point. So I could only increase the rate of reaction by adding more enzymes to that particular situation. Okay. Now, there are local conditions which can affect the rate of the reaction. One is temperature. To a certain extent, now you must remember all enzymes are proteins. Okay. To a certain extent, increase in temperature will increase rate of reaction. Okay. Then 
after a certain time like for example 10 degree means you would see a difference you would see a difference you would see it but beyond a certain time increase in further temperature will have no reaction because the enzyme denatures kind of like the graph in the next picture now human enzyme can sort of function between these temperatures if I increase the temperature it, this is the optimum temperature at would it work if you increase the temperature beyond this point for human enzymes it will denature it's not going to function okay and then there are different kinds of enzymes now whatever is holding true for human enzymes because humans have a limit or a zone for toleration for a certain amount of temperature that might not be the same for heat tolerant bacteria they might have a very different temperature requirement the optimum temperature for them may be this much and they can even go up to a temperature of 90 for them to be uh, still functional beyond which you would see the rate of the reaction sort of goes and falls down pretty quick and you wouldn't have any more reaction likewise pH optimum can be different now remember pH of mouth is near neutral okay so enzymes present in mouth function best at near neutral but enzymes present like the pepsin which is a stomach enzyme that has an optimum pH of 2 and immediately in sharp contrast the enzyme for intestinal enzymes trypsin the optimal pH is something close to 8 so you can see enzymes present in different zones have a different or pH optima depending on what is the condition that they are normally used to being in so depending on that now if I take the enzyme pepsin and then try to see the reaction that is taking place at pH 7 I wouldn't see a reaction I have to put or maintain the pH as 2 for me to see any reaction from that particular enzyme okay so this is something to be remembered about pH um, being an external factor which sort of affects the activity of the enzyme then you have um, competitors please excuse me let me just go back for a minute okay then there is something known as cofactors cofactors can be of two types coenzymes I'm sorry I'm sorry I'll repeat cofactors are something coenzymes are something else both of them have a similar function of helping functioning of enzyme okay cofactors can be a metal ion it can be copper zinc iron and so on whereas coenzyme is normally a protein it can be a vitamin sometimes normally protein or normally organic form okay. now <clears throat> another part of the enzyme activity is inhibitors helpers okay and how they help how they inhibit why do they do this this is also a part of enzyme regulation okay normally if this is the active site for the enzyme the region for the enzyme for the substrate to come and bind this is the way they would bind and I would have a normal reaction now a competitor meaning it competes for same site and it sort of sits there and does not allow 
substrate to bind in which case no reaction okay in this how can i how can i deal with this competitive inhibition if i increase the substrate concentration what will happen is i'll have more substrate molecules than competitor which means chances of substrate coming in contact with enzyme is high so i can deal with presence of a competitor by increasing the substrate concentration all right okay now non competitive inhibitor okay meaning it is not competing for the same site but please remember the structure the structure is very different final structure what happens is the non competitive inhibitor binds to another region in which case this is free right but it changes shape of active site in this case if it changes the shape of active site then substrate cannot bind no reaction so there are certain things that can compete with the enzyme and compete with the substrate for the enzyme to stop the reaction from taking place okay now this particular feature is also observed naturally in the living system which is coming under enzyme regulation okay we'll talk a little more about that by talking about the different competitors that is a little more understandable okay enzyme regulation now why do you need an enzyme regulation what does an enzyme do an enzyme is supposed to react with the substrate and give me product okay so that means as long as the substrate is present the reaction will keep taking place the product will keep getting formed what if i don't need the product that time that means i don't need my enzyme to work how will i stop it there is no button there is no switch to put it off but there is it is called regulation enzyme regulation one of the forms is allosteric regulation allosteric regulation you can have wherein enzyme can be present but it is not active till an activator binds to it inactive okay let me go to the next page and do this if necessary if the enzyme is inactive okay activator binds and then i have an active enzyme right now this activator can be a coenzyme or a cofactor like i was talking about it in the slide previous to this a coenzyme can be a vitamin okay like um it can be a heme protein a cofactor can be like an iron okay now these things you have organic forms and inorganic forms like you will have some metal ions that could be your cofactor that can activate an enzyme meaning it can expose the um till then the shape of the active site was not really clear so then this particular activator went and got itself bound to a certain region and that helped the enzyme become active or it exposed the active site the site where the substrate can sit okay on the other hand you can also have a different way in which you can deal with it an active enzyme okay you can have some the activator falls off 
you can have activator falling off to give me inactive enzyme or you can have an inhibitor binding an inhibitor binding to give me an inactive enzyme the inhibitor can be competitive or non-competitive like you had in the previous slide okay so there are different ways in which enzyme regulation can take place this is all dealing with um, the necessity of the enzyme to react or not react at that particular juncture okay then we move on to the next slide where I can talk to you about um, I just mentioned what an enzyme could be what a coenzyme could be what a co coenzyme is something organic molecule a cofactor can be an inorganic ion can be like a metal an activator can activate the whole process and change the shape or inhibitor can be to inhibit the whole process now mostly the coenzyme and cofactor work in cooperation with the enzyme so they show cooperativity now to understand the next aspect like feedback inhibition okay now feedback inhibition supposing I have something like an A to B to C to D to E okay now there are different ways now I have an enzyme 1 2 3 4 I have four different enzymes functioning in coordination one after the other like a cascade to give me this final product supposing I have a lot of E do I need D no so if I stop this enzyme okay if I stop this enzyme this will start accumulating if I stop this enzyme this will start accumulating that's not what I want I want to stop this enzyme so none of these reactions will take place and it will temporarily stop this particular enzyme from starting this process itself this process is called feedback inhibition it is like a control present in the cell saying I have a lot of this E I don't need this metabolic reaction pathway to take place so I will stop it okay so that is one way that it can take place now that is feedback inhibition now um, it can also work in a positive way okay sometimes if I want a certain um, positive feedback in the sense sometimes this was like a negative feedback I don't want this particular feature to take place positive feedback will be the uh, different sy system wherein something will bind to the first enzyme and sort of activate it and say no 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 now you have to start this reaction and continue with this like for example if I have A to B to C to D to E to F for example okay so I have this and I need this process to take place there might be uh, this particular is being stopped for some time say and it is sort of inactive so now this particular enzyme you have plus something positively attaches to activate it so it can be a coenzyme it can be a, a product it can be a cofactor and makes this active or the inhibitor 
can detach from the enzyme to reactivate it okay so all in all the enzymes that are present in your system there are some enzymes which are constantly present required and you have low level concentration present forever there are some other enzymes made when required okay so that sort of finishes this particular chapter on enzymes so what i want you to do is go through this entire chapter along with the textbook open and your sheets and pencil to take down notes and understand it as i may have gone through each slide pause it whenever you want to go back whenever you want to mark any topic that has been a little difficult to understand you have had difficulty in understanding and get back to me and we be ready to work on a um review sheet in class on tuesday take care thank you very much